So last time we discussed the foundational isms of European politics and society. Those were liberalism, conservatism, and nationalism. Those philosophies were driving factors behind many of the revolutions and attempts at reform in the early 1800s, as well as the unification movements of Germany and Italy in Europe. But we could also add capitalism to that, because it had also become a foundational ism for Europe. As Europe industrialized, it was embracing a laissez-faire attitude that the government should keep its hands out of business. But as the working classes grew more downtrodden, health declined, and the revolutions striving for rights or new borders were not always successful, new ideologies popped up. So now we will continue our dive into the isms phenomenon in Europe with the new and incredibly globally important philosophy, Marxism. This philosophy would be world changing, though not in the way Marx envisioned. So let's take a look at the original philosophies that led to Marxism so that we can not only understand his philosophy in theory, but why it has historically gone so very wrong in practice. To begin, we have to go back to economist Adam Smith's famous work, The Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. In this work, published in 1776, he argued that free markets and competition are the foundation for a healthy economy. Now remember that mercantilism was, in Adam Smith's time, the ruling economic theory. That meant that the government was intricately tied to the economy and did not wish to have its hands off. Smith argued that the government needed to keep its hands off the economy so that innovation could occur. He argued that new businesses and new ideas could pop up if the government wasn't so strict with its mercantilist actions. This meant that entrepreneurs could be allowed to flourish and innovation shouldn't be stymied by government red tape. He argued that the government is there to keep peace and order that it should be a political entity, not an economic one. Now, obviously his theories go beyond that. For, for our purposes, we will stay simplistic. But in 1776, industrialization was not yet in full swing. The population had not skyrocketed and revolution was not necessarily a fire burning through the Atlantic world, just one spot, America. Industrialization would thrive in a capitalist economy like Great Britain, but it would also generate great inequalities that needed to be addressed. The groups to address the crises caused by industrialization first are known as utopian socialists. They came from early places of industrialization like Great Britain and France, and several of them moved to the United States as well due to the freer policies there. Many of these tried to in some way mitigate the insanity caused by industrialization by creating their own small communes or independent communities that would run differently than traditional society. Robert Owen, for example, sought to integrate what he called enlightened management, or the idea that managers, that traditional group of the bourgeoisie, ought to be, well, nice. The beatings so common in factories, the long hours, the unsanitary conditions, those could all be solved with managers who are likable, nice, and put the well-being of workers first. It's kind of like the idea that you'll work harder for a coach you respect and like, or for a teacher you believe cares about your well-being. Charles Fourier, on the other hand, thought that the worst part of industrialization was the mind-numbing repetitiveness of the work. So instead, he created a community where you did different work every day. You might be in the factory on Monday, farming on Tuesday, teaching the kids on Wednesday, etc. But that kind of failed because it led to nobody being really good at much of anything at all. But his ideas were not wrong, industrial work was mind-numbing. Louis Blanc had a different idea, though. He sought to get political reform through the vote and get working classes to elect representatives that were progressive. All of these are ways in which they were trying to solve the problems of industrialization on a smaller scale. The communities they created failed, some of them due to bad economic policies, and others because their morality was in question by traditional societies, because they practiced free love, where anyone could, well, sleep with whoever they wanted. That works for a while and makes people happy for a while until pregnancies result and nobody will own up to being the father. Overall, they were controversial and ended because they didn't solve the problem of inequality in the larger system. That is where Marx believed he had the solution. So Marx was not some well-off intellectual. He was a broke philosopher that had to rely on his friend Engels for financial support for many years. But his ideas would be so radical, so revolutionary, that they would spark new political parties, ideas, and revolutions across the world. So what does industrialization have to do with anything? Well, to Marx, history has gone through cycles. He borrowed some ideas from another German philosopher, Hegel, 
and expanded on them. Marx says all history is cyclical. You have an economic and social system. That's the prevailing order. He calls it the thesis. That system is then challenged by something new, an antithesis, and that new order that comes out of that challenge ends up becoming the new prevailing order. So to him, you had to move to industrialization and capitalism because that's the prevailing order. Without the move to industrialization, workers would not be physically close to each other, workers would not be exploited and realize it as a group. So industrialization and capitalism, while evil, were needed in order to create the conditions that would allow for people to rise up and move into the next era, become that antithesis and create the next step, which would be communism. Marx became friends with Frederick Engels, both German, they both lived in the industrial city of Birmingham in England. They observed the terrible slums, the disgusting water, the child labor, the exploitative nature of British capitalism during the industrial era. And together, they wrote the ultimate guide to communism and how to achieve it, the Communist Manifesto. If you become a political science major, I almost guarantee you'll read it at some point. It's not long at all, and it is written for the masses, so it is easy to understand. So for Marx, society and economy are intertwined. Society is based on the economy because that's what creates the haves and the have-nots. This is materialism. The material goods and how money is made off of them control society. So whoever owns the modes or means of production of goods determines how society functions. Who is on top? Who gets exploited? If you control the means of production, aka the factories, the steel mills, the railways, then you have the power. But of course, the working class has no power because while they labor, while they work, while their bodies produce the aforementioned production, they have no control over their own world. They have no control over the production itself. They become cogs in a machine. And that leads to a feeling of what Marx calls alienation, a feeling that you have no control and that you can't do anything about it. Another theory that leads into this, that Marx writes about in more than just his manifesto, is the theory of labor value versus the theory of surplus value. This is central to his philosophy, so bear with me. The theory of labor value is that the true value, the true worth of a product, is only worth that much because of the labor that went into making it. The factory owners and managers don't actually produce the labor. They don't actually use their bodies in the pursuit of making this product. So they don't produce the value. What they do is they mark up the price. They add surplus value to make more money because it's capitalism. Of course they do. It's called profit. Surplus value is just the extra on top that you take over what the commodity is actually worth, the profit. Check out this example of the dress. A $100 dress isn't actually worth $100. The material is worth 18, the wages for making the dress are worth 12, so really the cost of the dress is 30 bucks. But it costs $100 because we need to pay for the factory or the rent of the building, the machines that make them, and then we still need to have extra money on top. So we inflate the price. But the extra, that $54 on the side that the retailer had, doesn't filter down to the workers who made the dress. Instead, it goes to the fat cats at the top. So the theory of surplus value is that the workers produce the most value in a day because the product is only available because they made it. But managers and owners would have nothing if not for their workers. But the wages don't match what their labor is worth. And instead, the profits go to the managers while the laborers keep getting paid terrible wages when nothing would exist without them. Marx and Engels believed that this unfairness would inevitably lead to conflict. This conflict would occur between the two industrial classes, the owners and the managers of the factories, known now as the bourgeoisie, and the working class, known as the proletariat. Now, people may not initially be able to recognize that they have power. They're too alienated, recognize that Marxist word, to recognize it. But that's what revolutionaries like Marx and Engels are for. Revolutionaries help the proletariat to realize both their position in society and their collective power. They will become conscious as a class and seek that power. Of course, the bourgeoisie won't take that lying down. They will not simply try to stop the revolution. They will use the power of the capitalist state against the proletariat revolution because they don't want to give up their own power. Marx believes this is why a violent revolution is inevitable. You can't avoid it because the government and the bourgeoisie will work together to keep the man down. Hence the famous quote from Marx, 
workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. They need to rise up and take control, even if it means bloodshed. Now, here comes the tricky part. According to the communist ideology, the proletariat, once they win the bloody revolution, will come into power. They will create a dictatorship of the proletariat, where the workers will seize the means of production. They will grab the steel, the iron, the railroads, the oil, and all of the major industries. They will then control it for a while as a dictatorship while they get everything set up for a classless society that is no longer based on capitalism because it's no longer based on private property. Ultimately, the idea is that nobody would be better than anyone else. Nobody would get more money. The society that would emerge would, of course, knock the bourgeoisie off their pedestal and raise the workers up so they meet in the middle. As Marx says, to each according to need, so they get whatever they need, from each according to ability. People would do the work they were capable of doing, and everyone would share the wealth with each other. So in those cases, classes would cease to matter. And when classes cease to matter, there is no need for a government entity to regulate people. So the government itself will eventually wither away. And that is why this is the tricky part. What does he mean by wither away? How? Also, the dictatorship of the proletariat is a bit touchy. What do you mean by dictatorship? Won't the oppressed just now be the oppressors? Won't the power be abused? So far in history, the answer is yes, the power will be abused. We might hit the communist revolution part historically, but we have yet to hit the classless state that is supposed to emerge after the revolution. So why isn't there a communist revolution until Russia in 1917? Why didn't it happen right away? Why, when workers' lives were terrible, wasn't there a Marxist revolution? Well, trades unions had emerged pretty quickly right after industrial capacity. Those unions protected people and began to create a way to organize within the capitalist system instead of overthrowing it. Socialist parties also offered another avenue. The idea of Marxist revolution was far more radical than the idea of joining a political party who wanted to work within the government to make change. That was far less bloody. Also, once Marxists realized that a revolution wasn't imminent, many of them revised his theories so they could fit within the confines of the capitalist system and still try to make it work for them. Also, governments and leaders like Britain or Bismarck in Germany were afraid of more revolutions, so they passed laws that were socialist in nature, keeping the capitalist structure but providing central benefits like pensions and health insurance. In this way, small gains were made that made a revolution not very feasible. Of course, Marxism was not dead, just slumbering until the right moment. Communist revolutions rocked the 20th century, from Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin in Russia, to Mao in China, to Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il in North Korea, to Che and Castro in Cuba, among others. But these revolutions were not pure Marxist revolutions. They did not rely on the proletariat to rise up. They forced the revolution and morphed Marx to fit their needs. Lenin created Leninism, Stalin, Stalinism, and Mao, Maoism, etc. So as we move forward in history, we will be coming back to Marx and revisiting his theories to understand the different brands of communism that emerge during the 1900s. So even if his theories are not used in their pure communist manifesto form, Marx was and still is an influential thinker, writer, and revolutionary of the 1800s that continues to influence the world today.